In today's story session, a tale about a cat who is a social climbing con man. This is Puss in Boots. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folk tales and fairy tales used to be, which in my opinion made them way better and more entertaining. I've got the most true to the original version of Grimace Fairy Tales that I could find, and we're going through it front to back, story by story. We'll figure out the sometimes unintended lessons each story teaches, and at the end of each episode, I'll adapt the tale into a movie or a TV show. So let's not waste any more time and get right to today's tale, titled Puss in Boots. And I realize I don't actually know the story of Puss in Boots. I've heard about it, I just know there's a there's a talking cat, right? And he's got a sword or something? Or is that just Shrek I'm thinking of? No idea. Let's find out together. We begin. A miller had three sons, a mill, a donkey, and a cat. The sons had to grind grain, the donkey had to haul the grain and carry away the flour, and the cat had to catch the mice. When the miller died... The three sons divided the inheritance, the oldest received the mill, the second the donkey, and nothing was left for the third but the cat. Definitely got a raw deal on that one. This made the youngest sad, and he said to himself, I certainly got the worst part of the bargain. My oldest brother can grind wheat, and my second brother can ride on his donkey. But what can I do with the cat? Once I make a pair of gloves out of his fur, it's all over. Ugh. The cat, who had understood everything that he had said, began to speak. Listen, there's no need to kill me when all you'll get will be a pair of poor gloves from my fur. Have some boots made for me instead. Then I'll be able to go out, mix with people, and help you before you know it. Not sure if I follow this plan. He didn't say how he'll help, just to get him some boots, and they'll figure it out. To be honest, you don't even need the boots. He's a talking cat. That's the selling point. Get people to pay to see this talking cat. It's the point of the boots. He says he's going to mix with people? Hate to break it to you, cat, but boots are not going to help you blend in with people. We continue. The miller's son was surprised the cat could speak like that. But since the shoemaker happened to be walking by, he called him inside and had him fit the cat for a pair of boots. When the boots were finished, the cat put them on. After that, he took a sack, filled the bottom with grains of wheat, and attached a piece of cord to the top, which he could pull to close it. Then he slung the sack over his back and walked out the door on two legs like a human being. Was the cat just waiting for the the old miller to die to reveal himself as this anthropomorphic talking cat? Or did the dad know and just, like, would not allow it? So now that he's dead, he can really be himself, this cat. Anyway, at the time, there was a king ruling the country, and he liked to eat partridges. However, recently the situation had become grave for him, because the partridges had become difficult to catch. The whole forest was full of them, but they frightened so easily that none of the huntsmen had been able to get near them. The cat knew this, and thought he could do much better than the huntsmen. When he entered the forest, he opened the sack, spread the grains of wheat on the ground, placed the cord in the grass, and strung it out behind a hedge. Then he crawled in back of the hedge, hid himself, and lay in wait. Soon the partridges came running, found the wheat, and hopped into the sack one after the other. When a good number were inside, the cat pulled the cord. Once the sack was closed tight, he ran over to it and wrung their necks. Huh. You know, I thought with him being a cat and all, that he'd use his cat abilities as a predator to kill the partridges. I thought that's where they were going with that. Because you think a cat would be uniquely able to solve this problem and catch partridges. 
But no, he just sets a very rudimentary trap for them like any person could. And also makes it clear that these huntsmen are terrible. All you needed was wheat as bait? That's all it took? Oh, all right. Then he slung the sack over his back and went straight to the king's castle. The sentry called out, Stop! Where are you going? To the king, the cat answered curtly. Are you crazy? A cat to the king? Oh, let him go, another sentry said. The king's often very bored. Perhaps the cat will give him some pleasure with his meowing and purring. Pretty cool sentry right there. When the cat appeared before the king, he bowed and said, My lord, the count, and he uttered a long, distinguished name. Sends you his regards and would like to offer you these partridges, which he recently caught in his traps. So I guess they don't even, whoever wrote this just didn't even come up with a name. He just said that he said a long, distinguished name. So you have to use our imagination for that. Winston. He said Winston. I'm just going to imagine that he said Winston. The king was amazed by the beautiful fat partridges. Indeed, he was so overcome with joy that he commanded the cat to take as much gold from his treasury as he could carry and put it into the sack. Bring it to your lord and give him my very best thanks for his gift. But that's not a huge reward, actually, because a cat probably can't carry that much gold. It's a human being carrying as much gold as they could carry. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of gold. Cat, not so much. Also, this means that the cat was very up-to-date on news of the kingdom, if you knew this, this king needed some partridges and would pay handsomely to, to get them. So good on you, cat. He clearly reads the paper. Meanwhile, the poor miller's son sat at home by the window, propped his head up with his hand, and wondered why he had given away all he had for the cat's boots, when the cat would probably not be able to bring him anything great in return. I still don't know why the cat's boots were even necessary. He could have solved the partridge problem just fine without boots. Suddenly, the cat entered, threw down the sack from his back, opened it, and dumped the gold at the miller's feet. Now you've got something for the boots. The king also sends his regards and best of thanks. The miller's son was happy to have such wealth, even though he didn't understand how everything had happened. However, as the cat was taking off his boots, he told him everything and said, Surely you have enough money now, but we won't be content with that. Tomorrow I'm going to put on my boots again, and you shall become even richer. Incidentally, I told the king your account. <laughs> Just throws that in at the end there. The following day, the cat put on his boots, as he said he would, went hunting again, and brought the king a huge catch. So it went every day, and every day the cat brought back gold to the miller's son. It's a nice little racket. At the king's court, he became a favorite, so that he was permitted to go and come and wander about the castle wherever he pleased. One day, as the cat was lying by the hearth in the king's kitchen and warming himself, the coachman came and started cursing. May the devil take the king and princess. I wanted to go to the tavern, have a drink, and play some cards. But now they want me to drive them to the lake so they can go for a walk. When the cat heard that, he ran home and said to his master, if you want to be a rich count, come with me to the lake and go for a swim. The miller didn't know what to say. Nevertheless, he listened to the cat and went with him to the lake, where he undressed and jumped into the water completely naked. So this guy's just completely following the cat's lead now. He's given control of his life entirely to this cat. Meanwhile, the cat took his clothes, carried them away, and hid them. Maybe it's just pranking him. Who knows? No sooner had he done it than the king came driving by. Now the cat began to wail in a miserable voice. Ah, most gracious king, my lord went for a swim in the lake, and a thief came and stole his clothes that were lying on the bank. Now the count is in the water and can't get out. If he stays in much longer, he'll freeze and die. When the king heard that, he ordered the coach to stop, and one of his servants had to race back to the castle and fetch some of the king's garments. The count put on the splendid clothes, and since the king had already taken a liking to him because of the partridge that he believed had been sent by the count, he asked the young man to sit down next to him in the coach. 
The princess was not in the least angry about this, for the count was young and handsome and pleased her a great deal. They just called him a count. He's not a count. We know he's not a count. This is a con. In the meantime, the cat went on ahead of them and came to a large meadow, where there were over a hundred people making hay. Who owns this meadow, my good people? asked the cat. The great sorcerer. Listen to me, said the cat. The king will be driving by, and when he asks who the owner of the meadow is, I want you to answer the count. If you don't, you'll all be killed. Okay, what? Firstly, I don't think the cat can deliver on that threat, killing a hundred people. He's still just a cat. If I were these people, I'd be more scared of the great sorcerer than one weird, kind of pushy, talking cat. And wouldn't the king already know about the great sorcerer? And that the great sorcerer owns this land? If there's someone called the great sorcerer living very nearby, like a single day's carriage ride away, gone there pretty quickly, you're going to know about it. Especially if you're a king, and the sorcerer lives in your kingdom or next to your kingdom. And thirdly, why does the cat think that the king will ask who owns this land? Who drives through places and constantly asks, hey, who owns this place? It's a dumb plan, cat. It's a dumb plan. I'm sure it'll work out, because it seems like that's where the story is going. But objectively, this is a bad plan. We continue. Then the cat continued on his way and came to a wheat field so enormous that nobody could see over it. There were more than two hundred people standing there and cutting wheat. Who owns this wheat, my good people? The sorcerer. Listen to me, said the cat. The king will be driving by, and when he asks who the owner of this wheat is, I want you to answer the count. If you don't do this, you'll all be killed. How is the cat staying ahead of this carriage? He must be must be a super cat, a marathon running cat here. Finally, the cat came to a splendid forest where more than 300 people were chopping down large oak trees and cutting them into wood. Who owns this forest, my good people? The sorcerer. Gotta say, the sorcerer is doing very well for himself. Listen to me, said the cat. The king will be driving by, and when he asks who the owner of this forest is, I want you to answer the count. If you don't do this, you'll all be killed. Okay, cat. You gotta, you gotta calm down. You've threatened to kill 600 people at this point. The sorcerer controls massive fields and forests. The sorcerer clearly is very powerful, and you're still just a little cat with some boots. And the boots aren't even magical or anything. So it's not like they give him special powers. He can talk regardless of the boots. He was talking before the boots ever came to the picture. And he's still just a cat. I feel like the cat is aiming way too high here. They had a good thing going with the partridges and the gold. They really lucked into that situation. I don't know why these huntsmen are so incompetent. But they had a good thing going with the partridges. Should have just stuck to that. This plan has so many holes. Also, the miller's son doesn't seem super sharp, and he's in the carriage riding with the king. I do not trust that he can pull this off and convince the king that he's some grand count. It doesn't seem very bright. Putting a lot on his shoulders to keep this ruse going. We continue. The cat continued on his way, and the people watched him go. Since he looked so unusual and walked in boots like a human being, they were afraid of him. Is it really that scary, though? Like, if you... If you no, a sorcerer. The sorcerer is your landlord and boss. You presumably regularly see crazy magic. Would you really be that scared of a talking cat? Soon the cat came to the sorcerer's castle, walked boldly inside, and appeared before the sorcerer, who looked at him scornfully and asked him what he wanted. The cat bowed and said, I've heard that you can turn yourself into a dog, a fox, or even a wolf, but I don't believe that you can turn yourself into an elephant. That seems impossible to me, and this is why I've come. I want to be convinced by my own eyes. Why would the why would the sorcerer care if this cat believes he can do this stuff? Ugh. 
That's just a trifle for me, the sorcerer said arrogantly, and within seconds he turned himself into an elephant. That's great, but can you also turn yourself into a lion? Nothing to it, said the sorcerer, and he suddenly stood before the cat as a lion. The cat pretended to be terrified and cried out, That's incredible and unheard of. Never in my dreams would I have thought this possible. But you'd top all of this if you could turn yourself into a tiny animal, such as a mouse. I'm convinced that you can do more than any other sorcerer in the world, but that would be too much for you. The flattery had made the sorcerer quite friendly, and he said, Oh no, dear cat, that's not too much at all. And soon he was running around the room as a mouse. All at once, the cat ran after him, caught the mouse in one leap, and ate him up. While all this was happening, the king had continued driving with the count and princess and had come to the large meadow. "'Who owns this hay?' the king asked. "'The count,' the people all cried out, just as the cat had ordered them to do. "'You've got a nice piece of land, count,' the king said. Afterward, they came to the large wheat field. "'Who owns that wheat, my good people?' "'The count.' "'My, you've got quite a large and beautiful estate.' "'Next they came to the forest. "'Who owns these woods, my good people?' "'The Count.' "'The King was even more astounded and said, "'You must be a rich man, Count. "'I don't think I have a forest as splendid as yours.' "'What? He's a king. "'Also, this is not taking them much time at all to get to this place. "'How oblivious... Is this king? And how tiny is his kingdom? This king doesn't know anything. At last they came to the castle. The cat stood on top of the stairs, and when the coach stopped below, he ran down, opened the door, and said, Your majesty, you've arrived at the castle of my lord, the count. This honor will make him happy for the rest of his life. The king climbed out of the coach and was amazed by the magnificent building, which was almost larger and more beautiful than his own castle. The Count led the princess up the stairs and into the hall, which was flickering with lots of gold and jewels. The princess became the Count's bride, and when the king died, the Count became king, and the Puss in Boots was his prime minister. The End Alright, I've got some problems with this one. When they pulled up to the castle and the cat ran down, they were with the cat earlier, just like by the lake. Why were... Wouldn't they be like, why did you just run up ahead? You could have just ridden with us in the carriage. Doesn't make any sense. Also, this sorcerer's probably got some pretty weird, crazy shit in his castle. How are you just going to explain that away? Like, yes, this is all my stuff. All of this beard oil, weird magic relics, body parts. I don't know what sorcerers get up to. He's going to have some wild shit in there. I don't know how you explain that away to the princess and the king. It's just like your hobby, just things you're you're into that you like to collect. That is going to be hell, trying to navigate that castle. Sorcerer's lair, essentially, when you have no idea what to expect, and you're also trying to play off that you're some count. Good luck with that, dumb Miller's son. All right, what do we make of this? Firstly, the sorcerer is an idiot. That plan was unbelievably obvious. If he's some clever, powerful sorcerer, there's no way he should have fallen for that. But even if he did, what about all the people who worked for the sorcerer? They're not just going to work for this random guy and his cat now. The sorcerer was very powerful, and presumably that's how he kept them all working for him. But this guy and his cat have no power over them whatsoever. The workers could just be like, yeah, I'm not working for you. Who the hell even are you? You can't just show up and be like, the sorcerer is gone, you work for me now. This wheat field is ours now, and there's nothing you can do about it, because you're just a guy and a cat. Yes, those are some nice boots, cat. I don't care. And I don't buy the whole everyone was afraid of them because he's a talking cat. Because even if they were afraid at first, or surprised, after a while they'd just be like, was anyone ever seen the cat do anything magical or powerful or dangerous like the sorcerer always would do? And the only response to that would be, well, he sets traps for dumb partridges sometimes. And the first guy would be like, wait, he sets traps? He doesn't even use his claws or teeth or anything? Because I'm kind of scared of cats, but he doesn't even do that. And the second guy would be like, no, he just, he just sets out grain. 
and then he, he scoops up the birds in a in a sack. And the other guy would be like, oh, well, that's not really threatening or impressive at all. He's he's not even a normal cat. He's a, like a wimpy cat. Doesn't even do doesn't even do badass cat stuff. Let's just not work for him anymore and see what he does about it. Because it's only a matter of time before someone tests their powers. And, okay, yet again, what is the point of the boots? They do literally nothing. And never come into play at any point. They just make them look more human? Is that... Is it just to make people think, Oh, that's weird. Don't know what's going on there. Or what the backstory of the fucking cat's boots is. But let's not ask any questions. Just do what the cat says. Is that it? Is that it? Just to surprise people? If you can't tell, I'm going to be honest, not a huge fan of this story. I feel like the only reason this story got popular is because people like cats. And the image of a cat wearing boots is cute. People like cats, and people like cute stuff. And that's why this story got popular. Because the story on its own? No thanks. There are some, there are some ones that I liked way more. Alright. Now, what's the lesson? Well, I did a bit of research, and apparently... The lesson of this tale is the importance of appropriate dress and charm as a key to success. And the boots symbolize moving up in society. So I guess the lesson here is, fake it till you make it. And also throws in that if you need to lie or even kill to elevate your status, then go right ahead. Because that's what the cat does. He lies and he kills. We don't know that the sorcerer was a bad guy. He might have been a great leader and super nice to all his workers. It said he's arrogant at one point, like he, you know, but the cat was questioning him, basically. The cat showed up and was like, I don't think you're that great. So it makes sense. He's like trying to, you know, play up. Yeah, I can do, I can do a lot of great stuff. For all we know, he was a great leader. He was a great guy. The cat, however, threatens to kill all those people, hundreds of people, even though he can't, probably can't make good on it. Still, he threatens to kill them, so they're they're fearing for their lives here. And if they don't, if they don't go along with his lie, and then he kills the sorcerer. The cat and the miller's son don't demonstrate that they're good or kind people in any way at any time. They're greedy, is what they are. Really, just the cat is greedy. The miller's son is just kind of going along with everything. He's just the cat's lackey. He's the face man at a certain point. So they had a good thing going with the partridge situation. And they weren't hurting anybody with that, other than some partridges. But, you know, can't be too upset about that. But they should have just stuck with that. But no, the cat had to get greedy and start making threats and killing people who may not have deserved it. So I think the actual lesson that this story demonstrates is that you can trick people by confusing them or freaking them out. With surprise or shock, the cat uses his appearance to freak people out and manipulate them. He's a con man, really. Puss in Boots is a con man and a criminal. And another lesson I'm going to take from this, don't trust cats. Sure, I've met some cats that were very sweet, but I've also met a lot of cats who sit on top of you, and then after like 20 seconds, they freak out and scratch the shit out of you. I knew a cat who really liked me and would jump up and sit on my lap, and I'd pet it, and it would be great. But when I wanted to stand up or had to go do something... The cat would scratch the shit out of me because it wanted me to keep petting it. Greedy, just like Puss in Boots. Sometimes when I left the room, it would run after me and scratch the hell out of my ankles and try to bite my ankles. That cat was in love with me or something, and whenever I had to stop petting it or go somewhere and and do something, it was just like, if I can't have you, then I have to destroy you. That was this cat's mindset. Greedy. Don't trust cats. And really, as a society, cats have just tricked us all into taking care of them. So yeah, that's the lesson here. Cats will take advantage of you. Don't trust them. No offense to all the cat owners out there, but you have been deceived by an adorable little con man. I'm not saying I don't like all cats, because there are some cool cats and some sweet cats out there. Shout out to them. I'm just saying, keep an eye on them. You know, you got a cat, keep an eye on them. I guess that's where I have to land in terms of my assessment of cats. Keep an eye on them. Okay, let's adapt this. It's going to be a movie, and the protagonist is going to be played by Ben Schwartz. And he's a guy who 
He's sort of a lost soul. And he spends his time hanging out at home with his cat. It's modern day. We're going to set this in modern day. And his cat is kind of a mean cat. But, you know, they, they, they've got a curmudgeonly sort of love between them. But let's say this guy, Ben Schwartz, he's an, he's an aspiring writer. And then one day, his father dies and leaves him a bar. And then he's got to run the bar, but he misses his cat. And he feels bad that the cat is home all alone all day while he's having to run this bar and figure, figure out how to run a bar. And so he meets a guy at the bar who offers to do odd jobs around, around the bar and take care of his cat while he's at work. And this guy will be played by T.J. Miller, actor, stand-up comedian. And T.J. Miller's like, if you give me free drinks, I'll hang out with your cat and do whatever you need me to do around this place. So Ben Schwartz hires the guy as a cat sitter. Slash handyman, I guess. Gradually, the two become friends, and the cat sitter talks about how cats are ultimate predators and survivors, and you can learn a lot from them. And when you need to decide what to do in a tough situation, think about what a cat would do. Then, the bar across the street, which is a competitor of theirs, and the owner was always mean to Ben Schwartz and his dad, and coincidentally said something awful to him a few days earlier, just so we know that, yeah, this guy's mean. And his bar... This competitor's bar burns down, and the night after that, Ben's bar gets a lot more customers, because all the people that would have gone to the bar across the street just go to his bar. So he got nowhere else to go. So Ben realizes that it was actually a good thing that the bar burned down, because now he has all their customers. So he's talking with the cat sitter, and he's, they're joking around, and Ben's like, hell, if the club down the road burned down, we'd have a packed bar every night. And the cat sitter's like, Maybe we should do it. Ben Schwartz, our main guy, he says, says, what do you mean? Cassidy says, maybe we should burn down the club. Ben's like, no, I was, I was joking. We can't do that. What are you talking about? Cassidy says, what would a cat do? He'd do what it took to get his prey. That's what. And what's our prey? That sweet, sweet cash is our prey, Ben Schwartz. And so initially, Ben doesn't want to do it. So he forgets about it. He's like, no, we're, we're not doing that. But a health inspector shows up and fines them for some minor infraction in the kitchen. And the cost of the fine is too much and would put them out of business. So Ben goes back to the cat sitter and he's like, all right, fine. Just just do it. You do it. Don't involve me. So they burn down the club and sure enough, he sees a boom in customers. And he's like, well, you know, it, it was morally dubious. Not morally dubious. It was bad. But this is great. We're making so much money now. And the cat sitter's like, yeah. And, you know, it doesn't have to stop with this. If you could just focus on getting your prey, like a cat, getting that cash, on getting the results you want, there's a lot more to be gained from that kind of mindset, you know? And so the floodgates just open at this point and escalates very quickly. And Ben, with the help of the cat sitter, starts doing a series of escalating things to get more money and profit and expand the bar. And they start selling drugs out of the bar and they get a tip from a guy about a shipment of liquor, and they steal the truck so they don't have to pay for booze, and he puts the cat sitter in charge of this part of the business. T.J. Miller is, is just the, the man handling all of this stuff. Ben just mostly sticks to, to the bar and kind of, like, he, he doesn't get super involved. And so T.J. Miller is running this part of the business, and now he's got a whole team of people who steal booze from trucks and sell drugs and start forcing nearby bar owners to sell their bars or restaurants to Ben, so they're expanding their empire. And during a few of the robberies and arson attacks, a few people even get killed. So he's getting people beaten up and killed and making a lot of enemies at this point, but he doesn't even care anymore because he's making so much money, and his, his conscious he justifies it being like, look, T.J. Miller, cat sitter, is handling all that. I can sleep at night. And he's finally getting the respect that he never got when he was a struggling writer, so... He's, he's putting it out of mind. He's just charging ahead. He's got the cat predator mindset. And he isn't worried because the cat sitter does all the dirty work. He's the one who beats people up and is in charge of the nefarious illegal side of the business. So he isn't worried about taking the fall. Because he knows it would just come down on, on TJ Miller. And he even buys the lot of the club that they burned down. And he builds a big, shiny, brand new club there. Let's say he gets, let's say he gets a flashy pair of custom leather boots as a symbol of his newfound status and authority, just to bring home the, the Puss in Boots connection. One day, he starts stepping on the wrong toes, and a couple of the people who he beat up and forced to give up their bars retaliate and trash his bar. 
and he freaks out and orders T.J. Miller to, to kill them and burn down their houses. And that's the final straw. And the police come into his bar one day, and they're talking to Ben. And they're like, look, we know what's going on. They're questioning him about his operation and telling him they've got all this evidence and to just own up and confess. So Ben is like, look, T.J. Miller, my cat sitter, is in charge of my business operations. I don't, I don't know what he does, so you've got to ask him. And just keep saying that until the cops are like, look, you keep mentioning this guy, T.J. Miller, but we've, got, we've never seen this person, never even heard of this person. We've got guys you've beaten up, and even a couple guys who've worked for you, and every, every single one of them says it's you doing this shit. It's you who stuck up the delivery trucks full of booze. It's you beating the hell out of your competition and forcing them to sell to you. It's you who burned down the club and the bar across the street. And nobody has ever seen or heard of this guy T.J. Miller you keep mentioning. And then Ben realizes that T.J. Miller was all in his head. Boom. Fight Club twist. It was Ben's dark side all along. He was inspired by his cat to do all this crazy dark shit. Ben realizes that it's all in his head and he just snaps. He kills the cop. He blasts out of the back of the bar. He sees that the place is surrounded by police and he just goes down in a hail of gunfire. And as he's lying on the pavement, bleeding out, his cat slinks out of the bar, slips into the alley, gives one look back at him, and disappears. The end. And that'll do it for this week's story session, Puss in Boots. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Come on back next week for a story titled Hans's Trina. That's confusing. It's the name Hans, apostrophe S, and then the name Trina. So this is confirmation. Every guy back then was named Hans. Every single one. Must have been unbelievably confusing with everyone named Hans. And I'm guessing in this next story, Hans has a lady friend named Trina. Now, Trina's not a name you generally associate with old-timey Central Europe, so maybe it's something else. I don't know. Only one way to find out... Come on back next week for Hans's Trina. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. <laughs> <laughs>